And I want to welcome everybody. It is 8.02. And so that's usually when we start welcoming everyone. Remind everyone that it is May 10th. Thank you for joining us on our Nemesis B3 implementation call. And uh, I said it a few minutes ago, but I will say it again. If you've not already done so, please remember to update your name so you can get credit for attending. And uh, these meetings are recorded. They're shared on the NEMSIS website. You are free to share them with your team members who are unable to attend. Um, and they are there for quite a while. So anytime you need to refer to them, you can. Uh, this is meant to be a conversation. So if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you have suggestions, please do not hesitate to join us on the call talk, take yourself off mute. Uh, we do want to hear from you. The whole point is communicating with all of our stakeholders, and this is one of those chances to do so. We do review the chat, so if you're unable to take yourself off of mute, please enter any information or comments or suggestions into the chat. We do review those after the meeting as well, if we don't get to them during the meeting. And let's go ahead and get started today. Um, Lori, are you ready with the stakeholder introduction? You are on mute, Lori. I am ready, Janet. Looks like you may need to stop sharing. There we go. And then will let me share. Hello and welcome. And I do want to jump in today with our stakeholder introduction. And uh, really the purpose of this is that we, oh, sorry, there we go, is to get to know other people on the call, build connections that we hope will lead to collaboration amongst different stakeholders here, and also just to have fun and get to know each other a little bit. So this stakeholder, when asked what they like to do to relax or un unwind, they said they like to work on logic puzzles, hike when the weather's nice, read fiction or how-to books with a latte, bake or sew until they get frustrated and stop. So be thinking if you have a guess who this may be. Something interesting about them is that they have hiked on a glacier in New Zealand. They have a farm in Montana and also spent a month touring China on a family vacation as a teen. What do they like best about their job? They said helping to fix problems and find solutions, um, both long and short term to issues or data collection pain points. So they are in, in the right job for that. Any guesses? Feel free to put a note in chat if you have a guess who this may be. This is Ann Vosbrink from Arizona. So thank you, Ann. And she shared some great pictures there. Oh, let me go back one. Um, Ann, do you want to share a little bit about the horses? I thought that was an interesting story. Sure. And I have my latte too. Um, <laughs> so where I live in Arizona, we are lucky enough to back a public trail. Sorry, there's the dogs. And um, we have wild horses that are um, right outside the back there on the Pima, Salt River Pima Indian Reservation. And so, I mean, you don't get to see them as often as you used to, but that was right after a rain. I have this whole video of just so many of them walking by. It was absolutely beautiful to witness. So. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, not everyone has wild horses running through their backyard. So thanks for sharing that photo. And then I also want to um, give a shout out to our states that have turned green and started submitting 3.5 data. And I do want to say, too, as of last night, we have received records, 3.5 uh, records from Illinois. So we have not had a chance to turn them green on the map yet, but it'll be coming in the next day or two. So congratulations to Dan Lee and his whole team in Illinois. And I know there's several other states that are close as well. So we are um, excited and we have several states that have resources and are ready to go. And just a reminder to com communicate with us if your transition timelines change, we have committed to updating that quarterly and that those changes have been updated on state pages recently. But if that changes, reach out to us and we're happy to um, update it on your state page when that happens. 
And then I just want to mention, I know we did close the survey last week for financial assistance to the annual meeting, and I hope to be able to announce sometime in the next week um, the recipients for that, what type of assistance or what amount of assistance we'll be able to offer and some more details about how to register. So thank you for that. And we are looking forward to um, seeing everyone in, in person in August. I'll pass it back to you, Jen. Thank you. All right. So I am up next, and uh, the first thing I'll say is the maintenance update. You're going to hear a little bit later from Diane Hartford about the um, blackout period. We uh, let you know a couple weeks ago on the B3 call that it was coming. We sent an email reminder out uh, earlier um, last week, and then Diane's going to give you some more of the ins and outs and what to expect. We have moved the maintenance window to the end of the blackout period. And as always, we will send out a, a notice to the Google group when that the maintenance window happens and then when it is completed so that you know if you're experiencing any issues during that time frame or anything like that. Um, so we've done our best to coordinate those two things. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the custom element development. So, um, we've noticed a lot more questions in uh, about the custom elements that are being put out for version 3.5 and the states are, are really starting to utilize those state data sets and get the custom elements within the state data sets. Um, and we just wanted to take this time to, to really talk about the need to work together with your vendors and not just your state vendors, but also your vendors, your third party submitters that your agencies are using and just keeping that um, communication channel open. The new uh, ACS trauma guidelines are an excellent example of the need to communicate the information back and forth from the timelines. You know, your states and your agencies want to know when you're going to be collecting that data. Uh, when do they need to have their software switched over? And the expectation for many of them is the 90 days, which is part of the best practices guideline. So if you're going to be outside of that, um, even if it's a longer period, you want to make sure to get that communicated out. And if you need help uh, determining who your third-party submitters are within your state, please feel free to reach out to the NEMSIS TAC, and we can let you know that. And um, the vendors, if you need to know who your state data manager is in a state you're operating in, please go to the map on the NEMSIS TAC site reach out to us, we will always help facilitate the communication to go back and forth. Um, it's really important, especially for your EMS provider agencies, right? They're they're really counting on, on, on getting the information. I, I, I think for the most part, they all want to do it right. They just need the chance to be able to do that right. So, and of course, if there's ever any questions or anything like that, please feel free to reach out. We have the help desk support tickets. You can always email me directly if you have questions about it or Lori at State Support, or really anyone here at the Nemesis chat. Um, were there any questions or anything about the custom elements? All right, see, I love when there's no questions because that means you got all the information that you needed. <laughs> so let's go ahead and move to the next and I will stop sharing and let Monet take over. Okay. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. Uh, let me see here. Okay. Should be able to see my screen now. Um, I would just love to extend the invitation to you to join the NEMSIS annual meeting. And I want to show you how you can register. On the NEMSIS homepage, on the hero slider, there is a link here or a picture. You can simply click on that picture and then you can go right here to register now. And one of the things I wanna mention um, in the in-person meeting registration, there are three options for the Tuesday pre-conference. The advisory board is certainly for those who are members of that advisory board committee, the state data managers forum is for the state officials only. So if you are a vendor and you have registered um, for this particular session, we will contact you or um, we will actually uh, redirect you to the next um, 
meeting on the forum, which is the interoperability workshop for the EMS software vendors. Um, and we will follow up with an email on that. Um, and then um, we also are working on a flyer for this interoperability workshop, what will be covered in this particular session. Um, we're working with um, a national speaker on this particular topic. And so you're definitely go going to want to be in a seat for this particular session, all three of these sessions. These sessions will not be live streamed. So we encourage you to participate in person. We want to see you. We're preparing for you. We have all kinds of goodies in store for you. So please get registered. And I look forward to seeing you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, you can uh, get off mute now and ask your questions, or you can send them via uh, chat or directly to me in an email. So let us know if you have questions or concerns or how we can help you. Anything anyone has to say at this time? Okay, we look forward to seeing you all. So thank you. That's enough out of me. Back to you, Jen. Thanks, Renee. Everyone is very, very quiet today. So um, the next item on there, Diane, if you are ready to talk about the migration to the cloud infrastructure, I think, I think. We are all anxious. It's been a long time coming. Uh, so, oh, it looks like there's a question on the uh, annual meeting. Yes, can a state DM attend both state data managers forum and the? They will overlap. Yeah, they will. They will overlap. Uh, uh, but if a member of a state <clears throat> or like a state HIE, uh, a person who may may be attending, uh, they are welcome to attend the interoperability uh, uh, workshop. I think that would be in, I, I, very appropriate and probably incredibly informative for uh, someone who's interested in interoperability within their state. Yeah, That's this year there's no limit. So, you know, the states, you can bring multiple people to represent your state, especially if you have someone who would be um, more of the IT side, the HIE side, so they can attend what they need to and also hear what's upcoming and what changes are coming forward. You're always welcome to bring multiple people. All right, Diane, take it away. All right. Can someone confirm that they can see my screen? You can. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, thank you again for inviting me to talk to the group today. Um, my name is Diane Hartford. I'm a senior IT project manager at the Utah DCC. Um, I've been the project manager of the migration project for the last couple of years. Um, my technical counterpart, Drew DeMarco, I think will be joining us. I just got a message. He's like, uh, forced Zoom update. I'm, I'm here. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so I just want to give you a little overview. The first few slides are new information. The remaining slides are a recap of what was presented last month. And if you have questions, please um, put them in the chat or feel free to speak up. So an overview of what I'm going to cover is uh, an update on the migration and the cutover, some URL changes to expect, uh, changes in the authentication process, password change freeze for service accounts, and the Nemesis web submission ciphers. So um, the migration and cutover from on-prem to the AWS cloud started on April 17th. We're about three weeks into the five and a half week process. Right now, this week, our internal IT team is conducting validation. So we're looking at what we, we're seeing on-prem and comparing it to what we're seeing in the cloud. Make sure um, we're, what we're expecting is there. Uh, next, with starting this Friday, we're going to be working with the Nemesis TAC 
to conduct user acceptance testing. We had our kickoff meeting for the UAT with the business yesterday. Um, and I know Jen sent out an email and uh, I wanted to reiterate that also on Friday, May 12th, we're gonna be starting our blackout period for website changes. So no, no changes will be made to, and I know like uh, when Lori was talking about the map and changing colors, I know that's a bummer because I know you guys want to change your colors when you're ready to change your colors, but there will be a, a blackout period. Um, as soon as that's done, uh, we'll resume normal operations uh, for the website. Um, also during this May 12th to 26th uh, window, Users should expect to receive an email from Okta to create your new authentication account. Some of this was communicated to you already via Jen in the Google group. Uh, these URL changes will go into effect on the 26th um, after the cutover. So the Nemesis public and state repositories will change. Um, the URLs will go from stash to git. Uh, those addresses are there. The Nemesis GIS, GI, GNIS URL will change um, to this. We will be putting redirects in place from the 26th of May to the 26th of June to give you um, ample time to update links in bookmarks or anything else that references those Nemesis Git repos or URLs. Um, there will likely be another communication that comes out during that two week period, um, notifying you if there are other URL changes that you can expect. Uh, we, had a, we had some questions last time about Tableau dashboards and reports. There will not be any changes to users, that all the changes will happen in the background. So if you go to the Nemesis website to view the reports, they'll be right there as you expect them to be. All right, this information is the information that we talked about last time. Um, the way that you authenticate will change, Okta will be used. Um, and as I mentioned in that two week window, you'll receive an email from Okta and for your new user accounts. Uh, the, our IT team will be migrating the existing service accounts. We put a password freeze on service account changes on Monday, April 17th. Um, and to clarify, service accounts are used by software or services. They are not individual user accounts. And those that password freeze on service accounts will stay blocked until the migration is complete. Um, the website, uh, I'm sorry, web submission ciphers. Uh, we talked about this last time. There is a, this is a link to what the um, TLS 1.2 for edge optimized API endpoints in the API gateway. Um, if you were interested in testing your system, um, you can go to the link. You, I'm not expecting you to read this, but this is kind of what you'll be looking for on that web page. And if you want to test the ciphers against um, your system against the new web submission ciphers, you can uh, accomplish this at the Nemesis onboarding site. Any questions? And I'm not seeing anything come up in the chat either. Jen, will this um, will these slides be available if we want to share with our IT people? Diane, are we sharing the yeah. uh, PowerPoint? Absolutely. We absolutely can do that. Okay, thank you. And Judy, I bet you you were not the only one thinking that. So thank you for asking the question. 
I have yeah. a question, Diane. I know you mentioned that dashboards would not change, access will not change if you access it through the website. If someone's used to accessing dashboards through Tableau, will that change at all? There will be a new URL if you go directly through Tableau rather than accessing on the website. Yeah. Sounds good, thank you. Hey, Diane, this is Clay. Um, would love to make that presentation available as Judy requested, and I'm sure others would like it. Is there, is there anything in that, in that presentation, any links or something that if we just sent this out, like in the Google group or uh, like a vendor listserv or a DMC listserv that we need to be, need to be worried about, or can we just go ahead and share the only the only caveat I would suggest is that it's clear that those links will not be those changes will not go into effect till the 26th of May. So if we sent it out this week and people are clicking on those links. Okay, that's good. Yeah, thank you. Drew, do you have any other caveats? No, yeah, there's no guarantee on what will what will happen if you go to those links before the, the official cutover, like the update, updatedness of the data. Um, and I, I just a clarification on the Tableau th thing. Uh, if you go directly to Tableau or anywhere else, like the, the link will be different. Like Diane said, um, authentication is different. It'll be using Okta, as she mentioned earlier, for, for user accounts, and you'll get credentials for that between between the, the dates that she stated. So not only will you all change your, your Authentication will change, but we're all we'll be setting up your accounts from existing users and setting up those permissions ahead of time. So you should see the same reports the same way, um, but you'll have a new authentication method. And if you go to Tableau directly, it'll be a different URL um, than if you go to it through the website. Uh, the emails that will be coming from Okta to set up the new user accounts uh, would those possibly be? Uh, blocked by spam or anything? Is there anything they need to do like to, or will it come from Nemesis or will it come from Okta? It'll Just come from them. Sure they don't end up in junk mail. It'll come from Okta. I can't speak to if I have, we have not had any issues so far with anyone we've worked with uh, at the university or outside of the university being caught by spam, but there, that's always a risk with any email. Um, I have not seen that play out. Uh, with any of any of the groups that we've worked with thus far over the last couple of years. Would it be good if they don't receive an Okta email by on the, by the 27th of May? I, so it would have to be after the window, but by the 27th of May, just reach out to us and, and let us know. Okay, so um, if, if any of you, I know I just said it, if any of you on the call don't get an email from Okta to set up your new user account, reach out, let us know you didn't get it so that we can work on that for you and, and research anything that might've happened. Um, just know uh, there's a question, will it matter if we already have Okta and use it and use it if it is used by our department already? So if they already have an Okta account within their own organization? No, the, so it'll be, a, it'll be a unique account to us. So it, they're using the same tool, but the accounts are not the same. Uh, the the MFA application that you use will you'll be able to use for both. You'll have two two setups within within that application. So you probably have a push or enter a code when you log into Okta, and you'll within your your application you'll see two sites for that, and it'll define you'll be able to see that from the different URLs your your current site and our site. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? This is Karin. I'm going to ask the question that I feel like I should know, and maybe I've missed a meeting, but I'm going to ask it. So for states that are submitting, are web service submissions changing and the accounts associated with that where everybody who is auto auto submitting, you know, is that changing? Yes or no, Diane? True. So yeah, that, <laughs> where, where Diane was saying that we're migrating the service accounts. So any your your whoever is doing your web submissions is using a service account. We've migrated 
those accounts and uh, so those accounts and passwords will stay the same during the migration. So there should not be should not be an impact to that, Karin. Awesome. Thanks, Drew. Really appreciate the clarification. Sure thing. And there will be no interruption to the web services submission of EMS records during the blackout period. Right. So please continue to send your data. Do not stop your data for the, for, for this transition. Any other questions? Oh, I guess I can share my the agenda. There we go. All right. And then, of course, if you come up with any questions later or your IT department says, oh, thanks for letting us know. Now we have this question. Please just send us a, a, an email or let us know that, that you have a question to answer and we'll get that information to you as soon as we can. Um, so next up, we've got Julianne and Clay talking about the release of the PWW and NEMSIS PCR data quick guide. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen okay. All right, we're just giving you a sneak peek, a preview at this really incredible resource that we've been developing with Paige Wolfberg and Worth. It's the PCR Data Quick Guide and it's FAQs on owning, amending, retaining, and sharing patient care report data. Um, if you recall, last year we spent some time um, talking to data managers about data questions and we gathered lots of your questions and um, need for clarification on data ownership, on data retention, transferring, um, amending a record, um, at, um, who should be able to amend it, what do you do with it um, when there's things added to it, a whole host of questions that we collected from data managers. And we set PWW to work on investigating those answers, best practices, guidance, and they have um, developed this really incredible 39 page, it's a big one, 39 page resource that will be publicly available next week. So you're just getting a sneak peek. Um, let me, I'll take you to another page um, just on some of the description of what's in this. Um, it will be, we'll do a formal launch next week. So it'll be available on our website. You'll get it through Google group. We'll send it to Nasemso to share out. Um, and make it available to anybody who'd like to use it. Um, many of you will probably want to share this with agencies and with um, EMS regions. There's just really great information that will be provided here to just dispel some of those assumptions or those myths about PCR data um, and, and answer some of the questions that you've, that you've submitted to us. So I, I wish we could give it to you all right now, but it's coming to you next week. We knew we wanted to just give you a little um, sneak peek on it, but watch for it in Google group. And also we'll share it uh, widely on the website and with other organizations as well. Clay, do you wanna add anything to that? You know, Julian, it was a great description. I uh, folks who attended uh, the uh, V3 uh, annual meeting last summer, either in person or virtually, right? This um, uh, kind of Ryan summarized the work that they've done here in his in his presentation, and everybody really loved that presentation. And he will be back this summer as well, right? So this this is great to distribute within your states and to be made available to agencies. There are lots of questions here that I think agencies would would find the answers very informative. And Ryan will be back. He'll he'll be interested in if you have any comments or clarifications or other sections that we might be able to add to this document. So yeah, please, please feel free to uh, distribute this as widely as possible. Yeah, thanks, Julianne. That's it for me, Jen. And Clay, you do have the next topic, which is talking about the suspension of the EMS by the numbers. Yeah, yeah, happy to talk about that. So uh, folks uh, probably know, right, since the big uh, kind of early on in the pandemic in 2020, we put together a weekly uh, PowerPoint presentation that went out as a PDF that 
was uh, entitled EMS by the numbers that kind of uh, indicated what was happening during the pandemic in regards to cardiac arrest or strokes or, or, or um, motor vehicle crashes and opioid use, just trying to watch and analyze those trends over time. We are suspending that document as of this month. And uh, so it's no uh, more updated on the on the website on a weekly basis. If you if you are using it um, and have an interest in in us kind of resurrecting that document, we'd love to hear from you. We've been watching hits to the site and it's it's just greatly decreased as we've moved away from kind of the the starkness of the of the early pandemic. We are we are uh, preparing to resurrect it in the fall if we need to do that in association with uh, influence like illness symptoms increasing among uh, uh, the calls that our EMS uh, folks are responding to. So we're, we stand ready to implement it again if necessary, uh, but it, it will be suspended for the time being and, and that's actually good news. So I'll pass it back to you, Jen. Thank you. Were there any questions for Claire Julianne on either of those topics? Thanks for sharing that in the chat, Julianne. All right, uh, Eric or Jeremy, if you are on, did you have any items from the Office of EMS NHTSA? I have nothing from the uh, office today, uh, unless someone has a question for me. Jeremy, do you have anything? That's nothing from us. Right? It's it's so quiet today. Um, all right, everybody. Well, that kind of takes us to the end of the agenda. I will remind everyone that on Thursday, May 11th, we have the EMS Interoperability Task Force from 1 to 2.30 Eastern Standard Time. The next public training is on June 6th. The invite will go out prior to that training. And we always encourage everyone to attend. Please share those trainings uh, with anyone that you like that you think would be interested. We welcome everyone to come. Um, Divdi, you have your hand up. Did you have a question? Hi, Jennifer. Yes, I do. Um, before we end the call, I wanted to find out. So I was contacted by one of our agencies yesterday who is beginning to start a new program called um, Nurse Navigator Telehealth. And I was told that currently they are using that program in other states. And the main reason she contacted me was because we currently in 3.4 and 3.5 do not have any elements that will specify that specific type of calls completed. So before we add any custom elements for them, for 3.5, I wanted to know if other states were currently utilizing that program with their agencies and how are they documenting those calls using the NIMSIS elements? That is a great question. I know telehealth has is starting. And to yeah, just more. to clarify, so this program is different than community paramedicine and MIH. That's what I was told by them. So we're just trying to figure out a best way for them to document this calls using um, three five elements. Is there anyone on the uh, call that has started to collect the telehealth? I know eResponse 05, the type of service requested and uh, has the community paramedicine and, and items like that. I'm not sure about uh, best practices that have been instituted in other states. So is there anyone that can, that can answer Dipti's question or has used it before? Uh, Dipti, this is Karin. Um, I'm working with South Dakota and I think Lance is still on the call as well. Um, can you, so I'm. A, it sounds to me like nurse navigator is different than doing telemedicine. Do you have a summary of exactly what Dipti, uh, Dipti of what, of 
what the nurse navigator program is and how it might be different than telemedicine? Because otherwise South Dakota could talk with you uh, about what we're doing and the program that's being implemented statewide in South Dakota. Um, I do not have a lot of information on the program. I was told though that um, it the request does come from the A911 dispatcher. And the whole reason behind this is to avoid wall time for non-urgent patients and ER overcrowding. And so basically um, when they get called at a scene and based on um, the assessment completed by the first unit who arrives there, if they think that they will need to call the nurse navigator um, telehealth folks, they will call them while they are at the scene with the patient and the nurse navigator will assess that patient and see if they need to go to an ER facility or not. Sorry, um, that's scary. all the information I have so far. Yeah, that's not what South Dakota is doing. So. Yeah. The card, I think, and it's going by different names, there's a telehealth committee with CMS and HHS and others. In fact, we just had a meeting this morning. Um, I believe that this is very similar to what was the original proposed ET3, um, the 911 piece that did not happen. Um, it's being adopted in a lot of places actually but essentially what's what's happening is it's it's like triage nurse triage within the 911 center for and this is where it gets a little blurry sometimes it's for 911 calls sometimes it's just for community input sometimes it's it's um insurance company specific or it, so that there's variations in the in the projects that are out there on that side of it but the bottom line is, is that someone is making an informed decision based on a generally an EMS assessment as to whether this patient needs to be transported by an ambulance and if they needed to be transported to a hospital ED or they need to go to primary care um, clinic, something like that. This is Josh Legler, and I was also going to mention the ET3 project, because um, one of the scenarios that ET3 covers is where EMS arrives on scene, and then they bring in a telehealth provider remotely, of course, um, and uh, they sort of transfer the responsibility of the patient to that telehealth provider, even though EMS is, is actually on the scene. Um, so, Dipti, there is a page on the Nemesis website about ET3, and they do have some custom uh, elements that they have defined um, to help them collect that that particular disposition where EMS transfers care to a telehealth provider. Um, so there might be some stuff that you could refer to on the ET3 page of the NEMSIS website. Yeah, and that's that's even yet another variation. The piece from ET3 I was talking about was the the 911 piece that didn't happen. So the piece that did happen even has part of the solution in it as well. So we're, we're actually, I'm not sure if Jay has it on the agenda or not, but one of the conversations for um, the SEMSO's meeting is going to be community paramedicine data, mobile integrated health data, and uh, I guess telehealth data. I didn't really necessarily know it as, as a nurse navigator, but telehealth data. In fact, there's a, there's a call next week about a, a large study that's being done with EMS in academic setting using EMS in, in predominantly rural areas. That seems to be where the focus is, and that certainly makes sense. But it also brings in a lot of challenges like connectivity, bandwidth issues, resources in general, hospitals to, to associate and affiliate with you know, long transport times. And if EMS doesn't transport them, there's not a, a, another option within, within a local area. So there's a lot to talk about on this particular topic um, in June. Um, at Nesemso, this is Karen again, at Nesemso, uh, 
Marty Link from South Dakota will be doing a presentation on what uh, South Dakota is doing. So for anyone who's planning on attending NSEMSO, uh, make sure you take a look at the schedule and see when that is being presented so you can check it out. Yeah, I, I understand he has an excellent program um, established and is establishing an even greater. Uh, I think Michigan has a pretty interesting telehealth model that's being rolled out and there's there are others there there are other really good examples some some larger in scale than others but yeah as Karn said that would be a great session to hear from the, the question that's going to come up is how much of this should be documented and I think a lot of it how it should be documented and you know before everybody goes out and recreates their own world um you know should it be standardized to what degree it should be standardized all of these things, I, I think, are going to be up to the state directors to decide um, the SEMSO and, and, and hold how much of this they're interested in and want to know. I've heard DSA very many times for the SEMSO that state directors are responsible for the care that's being provided by the ambulance services and by the clinicians um, in, in their states. That's, they see that as protecting their community, their responsibility, and that certainly makes sense. And I believe what's happening is, is that there are so many different variations of this. It's like the behavioral health um, services that are being provided in some areas by EMS. There are so many variations that they're not even sure what's being provided in their states. And I know that makes them nervous. So um, I think there's a lot of discussions to be had. I do want to be clear. We, we have no, I mean, we have no standards or anything established at this point that we're willing to throw out on the table and say, here's the absolute best way to go with this. Um, we've talked about it internally a little bit on how that could happen and what could happen, but uh, things like Nurse Navigator pop up, and that was certainly not one of the discussions. So um, that also crosses into the 911 environment with the uh, you know, the other side of the NHTSA Office of EMS that specifically deals with 911, they're working on standardization and data capture and uh, looking at how their their policies and standards tie into including a nurse and having a, or a physician or whoever's going to do like the telephone triage for uh, the 911 center. These are all new to them as they're new to many folks, but then you have to remember that there are thousands of 911 centers in the US. So we're, we're trying to manage this across the 50 states, but even within the states, there are many, many, many 911 centers. Not all of them have coordination like the EMS services do. So the other piece of that, just to keep in mind this, I forget the number and Kate would kill me. The percentage of those 911 centers that are managed by law enforcement is huge. So you don't have uh, the health leadership for all of those 911 centers. Just uh, a few little easy topics we can address in June. But uh, if you have ideas and thoughts, great success stories, please share them because we're trying to pull them together for those discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Were there were there any other questions? Well, this is Karen. I have a question for the public meeting June sixth. Maybe your stakeholder introduction next week can be who Angela Child is. Not to give away who the stakeholder would be, but it'd be nice to know who she is. That's a great idea. That's a good idea, Karen. I, uh, she's one of the statisticians here at the uh, here at the Nemesis Tech. Um, but yeah, it'd be great to uh, to introduce her. That's a really good idea. And that brings us to open forum, which we kind of had open forum, but but takes us back into open forum. Hey Josh, one um, one quick question. I'm I'm kind of putting you on on the spot here a little bit. I'm I'm really excited about a new uh, 
one of the discussion topics that's going to be held at the task force meeting. I wonder, I wonder whether it's just worth letting folks know a little bit about what um, how, what the agenda will be for that meeting. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So this is tomorrow's EMS interoperability task force call. It uses the same link as the call that you're on right now, and will be from 11 to 1230 Eastern time. Or, sorry, Mountain, 11 to 1230 Mountain. So did I get that right? Yeah, one, one o'clock Eastern. Um, so we've been uh, talking with people from the SAFER project. That's the uh, project that was done in California to get um, to where uh, EMS could get access to patient medical history, and then they could alert the hospital that they're bringing the patient, uh, file their patient care report with the hospital, and then later get the hospital outcomes. Um, there's been a lot about the SAFER project over the years. You know, you can find presentations about it and so on, all the kind of the high level stuff, the, the you know, what the project was about, um, but not the actual technical specifications that they used. Uh, you know, what standards um, did they implement? Uh, what was the actual sequence of interactions between the various uh, data systems? Um, and how did that fit within the workflow of uh, the EMS professionals and the hospital staff? So uh, we will have, uh, we will be discussing that technical side of SAFER on tomorrow's call, looking through the, the standards that they adopted um, for that project and looking through their technical documentation, which has now been posted in our um, interoperability uh, GitHub repository. So I'm excited that for the, I think for the first time, as far as I know, we will actually, we have actually made the SAFER technical documentation uh, publicly available so people can start looking at it and um, look, you know, uh, take things that they think would make sense in in the projects they're doing and uh, and decide on things that maybe wouldn't make sense. So that's uh, a big part of what we'll be talking about tomorrow. And then also some discussion about how um, vendors can get involved in the next uh, HIMSS interoperability showcase, which would be uh, spring of next year. Uh, but now is the time to start um, talking about that and uh, start getting plugged in with, um, you know, a group that you could work a scenario with and uh, demonstrate that interoperability. So that's what we'll be covering. Thanks, Josh. All right. Are there any others uh, for open forum? I've got um, I've got an announcement. This is a good time to put it out there. Um, we have two open positions at the Nemesis TAC, um, and we'll share those with you on the Google group as well. One is a business data analyst position. Um, we are very sad to say that Cassie Longheart is no longer with Nemesis. She is spending some time focusing on family, and we we miss her terribly. And the second position will be the NEMSIS program director. I My last day with NEMSIS will be June 2nd. I've accepted a position with um, Primary Children's Hospital um, here in Utah. So we'll have two positions going out. Um, the BDA position, there is potential for that to be a remote job. The program director position will likely have to be on location in Salt Lake. So some, some changes there, but the team and I will all work really hard to minimize any impact and to ensure that customer service and your user experience remains strong. We've got such a fabulous team here at the TAC. So just wanted to share that with y'all and we'll, we'll make sure um, that information's available to you if there's any interest. Um, not that we're trying to poach excellent people from other organizations, but... Um, <laughs> I yeah, but if there's if there's interest, please let us know. Um, and that's yeah, that's the end of my that's the end of my announcements. I would say something super nice about Julianne, but it, I get choked up. And so I'm not going to do that on a call with people from across the U.S. today. So 
we're going to leave it at that. Um, please join us for our next meeting on May 24th. If there are no other items for open forum, please remember that if um, you know of someone who's not on the Google group that needs to be on the Google group to get these invites, otherwise you can forward them this information at the bottom of the agenda. Uh, we always use the same contact information and it's on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. Uh, I'd like to just make another spiel to please attend in person, if possible, those hallway conversations that we have during the annual meeting are so important. And there's so many things that get discussed that are after hours or at dinner or while you're walking to do something or that just get mentioned as an aside. So it it's, would be great to see everyone in person or at least as many of you as possible uh, in person. Have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday. Thank you very much.